I want to say first of all again that uh, my wife Evelyn and I are very happy that we can be here this weekend to study God's Word with you. And before we get started, I need to repeat something that I uh, stated in our first session, our study, uh, because some of you weren't here at that time. And as you can imagine, in the work that I do, which involves a lot of travel, and speaking to God's people in many different parts of the country, I try to understand what would be the most helpful things to study with God's people? What would help them the most to arrive in the kingdom of heaven? And uh, I had uh, three messages prepared uh, to study with you this morning uh, and afternoon. Uh, I don't know if we will get to any of them or not. <laughs> because uh, as I mentioned this morning, early, very early this morning, uh, I woke up, and uh, I'm a very, I don't usually wake up early in the morning, I'm a very sound sleeper. Uh, and usually when I go to sleep at night, I hit the pillow and I just don't wake up until the morning. Uh, so it's not usual for me to wake up very, very early in the morning. But uh, it happens now and then. And uh, if the Lord wants you to be awake, you're not going to sleep. And uh, so I woke up very early this morning and I had a lot of thoughts going through my mind. And uh, I've learned from past experience when something like that happens, uh, I don't preach what I prepared. Uh, I preach what I woke up with. And so I had these thoughts going through my mind and uh, that's what I started to preach and uh, teach with you this morning. And that's what I'm gonna continue with now. And so uh, you pray for me that uh, I will be organized in my presentation. I have very few notes with me. I usually have lots of notes. I have lots of notes here, but I'm not preaching on those things. Uh, you pray for me that I will be able to uh, be organized in our study so that everyone will hopefully get the most out of what we're going to study. And we are going to study what we started studying in our first session. And we saw that the first angel's message was rejected by almost all the world. God foresaw that. That's why he had written in the book of Revelation the second angel's message. The reason for the second angel's message that's in the Bible is because God foresaw the first angel's message would be rejected. But God also foresaw that the second angel's message was not going to be enough. You see, God is serious about saving people. I used to tell my students when I was a teacher at Southwestern Adventist College, I told them, if the only way that God can figure out to save you is to allow you to suffer, you might be surprised how much you'll suffer. God is serious about saving people and He will allow people to suffer, He will allow them to go through or even send them trials and tribulations so that in an effort to try to save them, God is serious. And because salvation is serious, mm -hmm. it involves infinite consequences. You see, every one of us here, we're either going to have eternal life or we're going to have eternal death. There's just no two ways about it. It's going to be one or the other. And because it involves infinite consequences, it's already been demonstrated. God is willing to risk everything to Amen. save you. That's Amen. why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. to this world. Mm -hmm. And because God is willing to risk everything to save you, God is willing to take extreme measures to get your attention and to help you to make a decision so that you can be saved. And that's what the third angel's message is about. Mm -hmm. It is the last invitation of mercy mm -hmm. to a perishing world. And if this doesn't get your attention, there's nothing to get your attention. You're lost. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing that'll work. If, if this doesn't work, this will last, there isn't anything more. Even the, what we, some people call it the fourth angel's message in Revelation 18, but that actually is simply a repetition of the second angel's message. The three angel's messages, if this doesn't get your attention, if this doesn't get you to make, an, make a decision, well, there, there's nothing more. There's nothing more. 
Uh, Ellen White says concerning Jesus when he was here, I didn't bring the statement with me, but she says concerning the Jews that it would have been a rejoicing to Christ, rejoicing to all of heaven to save them. But she said, Jesus had exhausted the last arrow in his quiver. There wasn't any more means God had to win them, so they were lost. Now my friends, the three angels messages are like the last three arrows that God has in his quiver. And if this doesn't save you, if this doesn't result in your salvation, there isn't anything left. And so the third angel's message is one of the most serious, solemn subjects that any preacher, teacher, or congregation can study. And we're going to study it in just a moment, but before we read it and study it, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we're going to study. heaven we come to you now very humbly but earnestly praying that the angels of heaven may be in our assembly that your Holy Spirit may guide and teach us and open the eyes of our understanding so that we might understand the truth oh Lord help us to speak and understand truth save us from any harshness of expression but at the same time help us to deal with the whole truth I pray that you give us the courage to accept the truth, to stand for it, to live by it, and to teach others this third angel's message that is going to result either in their eternal life or eternal death. We pray in Jesus' name. Revelation, the 14th chapter. Start reading in verse 9. Then a third angel followed them. There's been two angels already. Saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The third angel's message has two parts. The first part, verses 9 to 11, is, as Ellen White says, the strongest warning ever given in the Bible. It is the strongest warning and threatening that is ever given in the Bible by the God of heaven to mankind. That's verses 9 to 11. Verse 12 describes the people that accept the third angel's message. The people that accept this message are described as holy people that keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Now the third angel's message is a big subject. And so we are not going to try to study every detail of verses 9 to 11. We're going to break it down and we're going to study a certain part. Let's break it down. It says here that we are not to do three things. Notice verse 9. The first thing that we are not to do is we're not to worship the beast. Because if you worship the beast, according to verse 11, you're going to receive the wrath of God. You're not to worship the beast. That's the Antichrist. That's number one. 
The second thing that we are told that we are not to do is we are not to worship the image of the beast. That's in verse 9. And again, in verse 11, if you worship his image, you're going to suffer the wrath of God. And the third thing that we are told not to do is we are not to receive the mark of the beast, the mark of Antichrist, on our forehead or on our hand. If we do that, then we're also going to receive the wrath of God, as you see in verses 10 and 11. Now, Adventist preachers, in preaching the third angel's message, have generally emphasized and dwelt mostly on the mark of the beast. Nothing wrong with that, because that's part of it. If you receive the mark of the beast, the mark of Antichrist, then you are going to receive the wrath of God. Now, the beast he is spoken of here is the beast that is described in Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. That is the beast that is spoken of here. And we could spend a few minutes going through identifying marks of that beast or the Antichrist. We know that the beast spoken of is the Antichrist because look in Revelation 13 and verse 5 and 6. It says, He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So we know it's an Antichrist power because of what it says in verse 6. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Now, the original meaning of the Greek word anti, antichristos, is a compound word, anti plus Christ, antichristos, antichrist. <coughs> the original meaning of the Greek word anti was something that stands in the place of something else. But nobody can stand in the place of God. So if you're trying to stand in the place of God, you are against God. And so today when we say anti, we usually think of it as being against anything. Anti anything is against it. And that's all right. That's the meaning that developed from that word. But the original meaning was something that stands in the place of something else. And there are three passages in the Bible that tell us very clearly who and what the Antichrist is and identify it. And those three passages in the Bible are in Revelation 13, 1 to 10, and 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 12, and Daniel 7, verses 1 to 27. Now, if you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, here it tells us when we're talking about the Antichrist we're both talking about somebody that stands in the place of God and somebody that's against God. Notice what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 starting with verse 3 Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Notice, he opposes God, but actually he stands in the place of God, in the temple of God. That's what it says in verse 4. So the word Antichrist has both meanings. It means somebody that stands in the place of God, somebody that's against God, because you can't really be in the place of God. God says, I will not give my glory to another. That's Isaiah 42. So... Everybody recognizes, it's even in the New Roman Catholic Bible, in the margin in 2 Thessalonians 2, that this passage is talking about the Antichrist. It's plain from verses 5 and 6 in Revelation 13 that that passage is talking about the Antichrist. The other passage in the Bible that talks about the Antichrist is in Daniel 7. And if you look in Daniel 7, this shows us that God foresaw the Antichrist developing 2,500 years ago and wrote it, had it written down. In Daniel 7, 
concerning the little horn power, in verse 25 it says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for time and times and half a time. So, you see here, this is an Antichrist power. It's going to be against us, speak great words against the Most High, pompous words against the Most High. It's going to persecute the saints of the Most High. And a prominent characteristic of the Antichrist in the Scriptures is that the Antichrist will attempt to make a change in God's law. That's what it says here in verse 25. Amen. It will attempt to make a change in God's law. It will attempt to change the times in God's law. That has a biblical mark of the Antichrist. And that's the same thing that Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians 2. If you turn back to 2 Thessalonians 2 again, notice when he's talking about the Antichrist, what he calls him. He says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, excuse me, verse 3, he calls him the man of sin. Remember, sin is breaking God's law. That's verse 3. And then if you go down to verse 7, it says the mystery of lawlessness. No, that's breaking God's law. Will be revealed. And then it says in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, a prominent characteristic of the Antichrist is lawlessness, breaking God's law, teaching people to break God's law. And it says in verse 11, it says, For this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Well, what is the lie? It is the original lie. It's the original lie. It is the lie that hundreds of millions of professed Christians all over the world believe today. And what was the original lie? The original lie was the idea that you can sin, you can disobey God, and still live. Isn't that what the devil told Eve? Yes. Eve said, the Lord told us that if we, if we eat of this fruit, we'll die. The devil said, no, you won't. You can eat of it, you won't die. In other words, you can sin and not die. That is the lie. That is the lie that is even believed today by many Seventh-day Adventists, I'm sorry to say. It's the idea that you can go on and sin. We have people teaching in our colleges that say, you're going to sin until the second coming. Well, yes, people are going to sin until the second coming, but then they're going to be destroyed. People are not going to sin until the second coming and then go to heaven. That's the lie. The idea, you can keep on sinning, just keep your sins confessed. Then you go to heaven. That's what the Roman Catholics believe. They, they're not taught that they can overcome. They know they're going to sin their whole life, but some of them go to confession every week and some of them go to confession often every week. And so they keep their sins confessed. And because they keep their sins confessed, they think that they're going to heaven. Where is a text in the Bible that says, if you keep your sins confessed, you will go to heaven? The Bible teaches that not only are we to confess our sins, but we are to overcome our sins. We're to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Amen. And so when you read the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the promise of salvation to, written to the seven churches. And the seven churches represent the church of God throughout all time. And the promise of salvation is given only to the one that overcomes. It's that way in every single church. Amen. Read Revelation 2 and 3. Amen. And the same is true in, in the last of the book. Look at Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Verses 5 to 7. We could read verse 8 too, but it's not an enjoyable verse to read. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. He who overcomes, he will inherit all things. 
Are you an overcomer? My dear friend, you, if you are not an overcomer now, you must become an overcomer if you are going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. That's what it says in Revelation 21. Says. It's the overcomer that's going to receive everything, going to inherit everything. That's what it says in Revelation 2 and 3, seven times, each one of the churches. We could have a Bible study right now going through the Bible, and especially in the writings of the Apostle John. In 1 John, he says, or oh, talks over and over again about the necessity of overcoming. The one that's overcome will have eternal life. But the Antichrist teaches people that you can be saved in sin. As long as you keep your sins confessed. And hundreds of millions of people believe that. Does that help you to understand why there's some people that are so diligent to go to confession so often? Because they believe that if their sins are confessed, they'll be in the kingdom of heaven. Now they, they expect they're going to commit those same sins next week. But they're going to go to confession next week too. But friends, that's not, that's not the gospel that the apostles preached. The gospel that the apostles preached was that when you confessed your sins, you surrendered your life to Christ, you would receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would give you the power to live a new life, to overcome those sins. Now, the first thing in the, that we're warned against in the third angel's message is that we are not to worship the beast. We are not to worship Antichrist. And yet, according to the book of Revelation, how many people in the world are going to worship out Christ? Well, let's read that. Look in Revelation 3, 13, excuse me. Revelation 13, verse 3. It says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. How much of the world? All, all the world. Look at verse 8. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship Him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And it says in the last part of verse 7 that authority was given Him over every tribe, language, and nation. Now, who is this Antichrist, this beast power, that we are not to worship? Let's look at several identifying marks, first of all, in Revelation 13. First of all, it says, it tells us that this beast power is a religion. Where does it tell us that this beast power is a religion? Because it says, in verse 4, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast. So we know that it's a religion. People do not worship the President of the United States. They don't, they don't worship governors. So the fact that they worship this beast shows you that it has to be a religion. Not only that, it says that this is a worldwide religion. You can see that in verse 3. You can see it also in the end of verse 7. It is a worldwide religion. And then it says in verse 2, the last part of verse 2, that the dragon gave him his power his throne or seat of government and great authority. Now, according to Revelation 12, the dra verse 9, the dragon is the devil. But the dragon has human representatives also. If you, if you look in Revelation 12 and verse 4 concerning the dragon, it says, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And 
she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It says that the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child, to destroy her child as soon as it was born. Was there an attempt to destroy Christ as soon as he was born? Amen. Yes, there was. Who tried to do it? Herod. Herod. Who is Herod? He was a Roman governor. So, the dragon represents not only the devil himself, although he's the ultimate dragon, it also represents the pagan Roman Empire. Amen. So the pagan Roman Empire would give to the Antichrist his power and his throne and his great authority. And then it says that this power, verse 3, is going to receive a deadly wound. A wound that would look like would kill him. But it wouldn't. He would recover from the deadly wound. And after he would recover, then it says that all the world would marvel and follow the beast. Now, when you put all of these things together, notice a religious power, a worldwide religious power, a religious power that receives his power and his seat of government and is thrown a great authority from the pagan Roman Empire. A power that received a deadly wound, and then after it received the deadly wound, the deadly wound was healed, and the whole world wonders after. You put all of these things together, there's no other religion that it could be except the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. Amen. Did the papacy receive a deadly wound? Yes. Amen. On January 1, 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte gave an order to his general, Berthier, to go down to Rome and capture the Pope. And Berthier went down to Rome. But before the end of February, the Pope not only was captured, he was taken away as a prisoner. He was taken up to Valence, France, and he was put under what we would call today house arrest. So there wasn't any Pope in Rome anymore. And he, the Pope at that time was about 82 years of age. And he stayed in Valence, France, under house arrest, until he died toward the end of July in 1799. And when that happened, uh, at least half of Europe thought that the Roman Catholic Church is over. There's never, this, it's, it's done. It's, it's done. Not a hand of all the different governments in Europe that had protected the papacy for over a thousand years and the strongest one, of course, was France, and they were the one that took him captive. There was a spirit of rationalism, agnosticism, infidelity, atheism sweeping over Europe during that time. And they saw the inequities that had been fostered on the people, and it made them so angry that said, we're not going to have any of this anymore. And they took the Pope captive, they took him up to Valence, France, and he was in house arrest there until he died toward the end of July in 18, uh, 1799. And people thought that this is the end of the papacy. Now in March, that'd be over six months later, in March of 1800, the people got together down in Rome and they elected a new pope, but it was not the same. Let me explain for those of you that have not studied history. We have a ways to go yet to get where we want to go, but you need to understand this in order to understand what we're going to study. You need to understand how after 1800, even though they elected another pope, the papacy was not at all the same as it was before. Not at all the same. Let me explain. When Justinian 
had given to the Pope great authority. He, he said that he was giving him authority over all the churches. The papacy had a doctrine then that they still have today. And let's just read it. Look in Luke. You can see, I'll show you the, one of the texts that they used to, to uh, prove this doctrine. If you look in the book of Luke in chapter 22, if you read verses 35 to 38, Notice what Jesus says here. He said to them, When I sent you without money, <clears throat> bags, sack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a sack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this, is, that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. Then they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now the papists said, look, Jesus didn't say it was too much. He said it is enough. And they said, there are two swords. One is the spiritual sword. That's what we have. The sword of the spirit. That's a spiritual sword. The other sword is the temporal sword. And Jesus did not say that it was too much to have two swords. He just said it is enough. And so, the papacy is built on the idea that the church, which wields the spiritual sword, should control the state who wields the temporal sword. And that was the teaching through all of their writings throughout the Dark Ages. They used this text to prove it, the two swords. And they said, there's a spiritual sword, there's a temporal sword. But the, the church which holds the spiritual sword should control the state which own, owns the temporal sword. And so, you, know, you can read about it, the great controversy about page 380. I might have a statement here somewhere written about that, about the, how the papacy... Uh, I'm not going to take time to look it up. I think I do have it here somewhere. But I'm not going to take time to look it up. The papacy taught, you can look it up in Great Controversy along about page 380, right in there. And again, in the 440s, the book Great Controversy. The papacy taught that the power of the state should be controlled by the church. They still believe that. And the papacy, not only that, but the papacy was a union of church and state. So that they controlled an area in southern Italy that was called the Papal States. But after 1798, they didn't have any temporal authority anymore. They still had the spiritual sword. They still had, they still called themselves the Christian church. But they did not have any temporal authority anymore. They had received a deadly wound. They had no temporal authority anymore. And secular armies went through convents and all sorts of places and set people free. Spain and Italy and other places. But that is the genius of the papacy. It is a union of church and state where the church influences the state to, quote, do what's right. What the church thinks is right. And that was the doctrine, of course, that brought on the Dark Ages. Because what if some Christian didn't agree with the Roman Catholic Church on how he should practice the Christian religion? Well, the church used the state to enforce her will. That is 
the genius of the papacy. And the papacy is a union of church and state and is a church that uses all states to enforce her will. In 1929, that deadly wound began to be healed. Because in 1929, up until that, between 1798 and 1929, the papacy, they had spiritual authority. They were still a, quote, church, unquote, by their profession, but they had no temporal authority. But in 1929, that deadly wound began to be healed. Because Mussolini made a deal with the Pope that he would give to them. Now in Rome, in Rome, the city of Rome, the city of Rome contains seven mountains. One of those mountains is Mount Vaticanus. And that mountain was given back to the papacy so that they own it. If I remember right, it's about 109 acres. It's, it's one of the smallest countries in the world. But it is a country. It is a state. The nation of Italy does not control that country. That is a separate state, sovereign state. And that's why in 1984, when President Reagan decided to send an ambassador to Rome, and there were some Protestants that objected, the Protestants objected so much when President Truman was going to do it that he didn't do it back in about 1951. But when Protestants objected to the United States sending an ambassador to Rome, the Catholics said, well, Rome is not just a church. Rome is a country. Rome is a nation. Rome is a sovereign state. So Rome has ambassadors to all different countries, and they receive ambassadors from all different countries. Rome, the papacy, is a system where the church and the state are united, but the church has the upper hand over the state. The church controls the state to do what she wants to do, wants to have done. That is the beast power. The antichrist power. Now, in the third angel's message, you're forbidden to worship the Antichrist, the beast power, if you worship it, you are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Not only that, you're going to be in hellfire. That's what the third angel's message says. But that's not all. The second part of the third angel's message, which we are going to spend some time on, not only are you not to worship the beast, the Antichrist, but you are not even to worship the, the image of the beast. If you worship the image of the beast, you are all going to be in hellfire, just the same as the people that worship the beast. Now, the image to the beast, worshiping the image of the beast, is something that we need to study. We need to understand how an image of the beast is built and what it means to worship it. Turn your Bible to Revelation 13. Now, let's read, uh, first of all, verse 10. He who leads into captivity. Who is that? Well, that's the beast power. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. When did that happen? 1798. The Pope was taken prisoner and he died in captivity. Now this is a dual prophecy. The Pope was not killed with a sword at that time. <coughs> but the papacy is going to go into have another day. Well, this time he's, he's not just going to go into captivity. This time he's going to be killed with a sword. This is yet future. It says, he who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. That's, that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. Here's the patience of faith of the saints. Verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, you know what a beast is in Bible prophecy. A beast is a kingdom or a power. In Daniel 7, it says, 
in verse 23, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom. It's going to be different from all the kingdoms. So a beast represents a kingdom or a power. It could be a church, it could be a state, it could be a government, it could be a kingdom. So now we see another power coming up in verse 11. Another beast. And when does he see this? He, it's about the time that the first beast is going into captivity. So it's about 1798. That's when he sees this happen. He says, then I saw another beast. The time of the first beast going into captivity. 42 months are over. 1260 days are over. 1798. He goes into captivity. Then he sees another beast coming up. Another power coming up. And we can tell from the context when we read the next verses is that this other power comes up and becomes a world power after the first power, uh, the first beast, goes into captivity, receives a deadly wound. We'll get there hopefully in a few minutes. So they saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now this is a singular expression. All the other beasts that are mentioned. If you look at the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter, all the beasts arose from the sea. If you look in Revelation 13, verse 1, this first beast, it also arose from the sea. And we know what the sea represents because it says in Revelation 17, 15, it says, He said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So the sea represents peoples, multitudes, nations and languages did the first four beasts in Daniel 7 did they all arise in the middle of great populations of people well yes they did if you look at Babylon, look at Medo Persia, look at Greece Rome, they all arose in the area of the world that was heavily populated the area surrounding the Mediterranean Sea that was the area that was most heavily populated in ancient times and that's where all those nations arose the papacy also arose in that same area and they all arose from the sea. But this power does not arise from the sea. It does not arise where there's multitudes and nations and languages and lots of people. It doesn't arise there. It doesn't arise from the sea. It arises from the earth. So we know from that inscription, this power could not arise in Europe. It could not. It could not arise in Africa. Because that nation, that, that continent has been heavily populated for thousands of years. It could not arise in the Middle East. That area has been heavily populated for thousands of years. It could not arise in India. That area has been heavily populated for thousands of years. It could not arise in China or Russia. That area has been heavily populated for thousands of years. It doesn't arise in the sea or from the sea. It arises from the earth. It has to arise some other place. Well, there's only three other places in the, in the earth that it could arise where it weren't heavily populated. It'd have to arise either in Australia or South America or North America. That's the only other places there are that are not heavily populated. Okay, and then look what it says. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb. He had two horns like a lamb. Now this is completely different than the other beasts too. What were the other beasts described as in Daniel Revelation? Well, you have a lion. <laughs> Do you want to meet a lion? You want to walk and take a walk at night? Would you like to meet a lion? Most people would. And then there was a bear. We were in Colorado. I went to take a walk at night. My wife came after me in the car. She says, you get in the car, you don't take a walk out here. They say they have mountain lions out here. Okay. Where we were the uh, night before last, uh, we asked them, you know, you have, you have, we're out of the country. Do you, have, do you have mountain lions out here? Do you have bears out here? I want to know before we go taking a walk. The second power was a bear, and then there was a leopard. You want to meet a leopard when you go for a walk? And then there's an awful beast worse than any of those. And then this, this beast here in Revelation 13, it was like a, a lion and a bear and a leopard, all three. 
beasts of prey, the kind of beasts that you would want to meet. But this beast is not like that. This power has horns like a lamb. Are you afraid of meeting a lamb? No. Why? Because a lamb is gentle. A lamb is innocent. It's not dangerous. So this is describing a power that when it arises, it's not like a lion, it's not ferocious, it's, it's gentle. It's innocent. It's like a lamb. But this power, it says that it becomes a world power so much that it deceives the people that dwell on the earth. Verse 14, this power becomes a world power. Now let's think that through. Put all the things together that we just studied. About the time, 1798, the prophet sees a power coming into existence that does not arise in, amid the multitudes of peoples and nations in Europe or Africa or Asia. And it's gentle. And it's innocent. But it becomes a world power. You know what I mean, power like that? That was arising in 1798. That was so gentle and so innocent that people from all over the world wanted to come and live in that country. It was gentle and innocent. It didn't arise in Europe or Africa or, or the Middle East. It, it arose in a place where there weren't so many people. But it became a world power. There isn't any power that I can refer to, friends, except the United States. That's the only nation that fits. And the scary thing about this is that it says in the last part of verse 11 that this power began to speak like a dragon. Not only that, it says in verse 12, He exercises all the authority of the first beast in His presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, what was the first beast? The first beast was the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. The United States is going to tell people all over the world to worship the first beast, to worship the papacy. Now, people used to scoff and say, oh no, that'll never happen. This is a Protestant country. My mother could remember when people thought that we were crazy, that what we preached about the three angels' message could, and about Revelation 13 in the United States could never happen. They said, that'll never happen. This is a Protestant country. It's not wise, friends, to skip to an argument with the Word of God. So he exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. We'll run out of time if I explain verse 13. That's not that I can't explain it. We don't have the time. Verse 14. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So now, he's telling the people to make an image to the beast. And then not only that, it says in verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. You know, back in Daniel's day, there was a great image that was built in Babylon, which is a type of this. And when those three Hebrew worthies were walking the streets of Babylon, they saw that image being built. It took some time to build it. They saw the feet being built, and then the legs, and then the waist, and then the belly, and then the chest, and then the shoulders, and the arms, and the neck, and then the head, and finally the image was completely done. Everything had been all right while that image of the beast was going up until it was all done, and when it was all done, you either had to worship it or get killed. 
Do you realize that that very same thing is happening right now? And people that don't recognize what's going on is just the same as when they were walking through the streets of Babylon then and they saw this image going up and uh, everything was all right. But once that image was completed, if you didn't worship it, then you were killed. I think I do want to take time to read a statement or so from the Spirit of Prophecy about this image before I go farther. This is Great Controversy, page 445. What was, what was the genius of the beast power? It was a church united with a state that controlled all states in Europe. So what would the image of the beast be? It would be when the churches control the state and influence the state to do what they want done. And remember, if you worship the image of the beast, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be lost. When an image of the beast is built, when an image of the beast is built, if you obey that image, remember, Whoever you obey, that's your that person's servants. Whoever you obey, you're that person's servants. We're coming right now in a few minutes to some very hard things. I hope you listen carefully. You can go study it for yourself. Some of you aren't going to believe this, when I tell you. You can go and study it for yourself. I'll read it first from Great Controversy, page 445. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will form an image of the Roman hierarchy, and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably resolve. What is the image of the beast? It's when the churches influence the state to enforce their decrees, to enforce their will on people. Now friends, the bad news is that right now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is building an image to the beast. Amen. That's the bad news, but it's the truth. We've always looked and we've always been told, and I've been told all my life, that this, this will be the Baptist church and the Methodist church and the Christian church and the churches of Christ and there will be all of those. But they'll, they'll do it. We, will, we won't do it. Mercy. We're doing it. Mercy. Do you understand from what we've studied, do you understand what an image of the beast is? Yes. An image of the beast is when a church influences the state to do what they wanted to have done. Yes. And they enforce their will by means of the state. That is the way, friends, that Jesus was crucified. Yes. My Lord. You know, during the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church used to say, we didn't shed any blood. Yes. The state shed the blood. Well, who told the state to do it? Who had the state do it? I see. The church had the state do it. I see, Lord. Now, how does a church influence the state to do what they want to do and, in, and enforce their will. There's three ways. The first way that a church influences the state to do what they want to do is to develop a relationship with either the king or the president or the ruler and then persuade him to do what you want done. We call these today in the United States lobbyists. The second way that a church influences the state to do what they want done is to influence the legislature. Now the legislature are the people that make the laws. In the United States we call it the Congress. The people that make the laws. And so there's all kinds of churches and all kinds of groups that have lobbyists in Washington, D.C. to influence the legislature to make the kind of laws that they want made. 
And by the way, one of those churches that has lobbyists in Washington, D.C. to influence the legislature is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. That's the second way. And the third way, and this has been the most popular way for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the third way that a church influences the state to do what they want to do is through the courts. Because the courts of the state enforce the laws that the legislature made. The courts enforce the laws. Those are the three ways. Influence the president or the king. Influence the legislature, the, leg the, the people that make the laws. Or influence the courts that enforce the laws. And at Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have been going to court to get our way to force people to do what we want them to do for My over 25 Lord. years. My Lord, help us, Jesus. That is building an image to the beast. Yes. Lord. If you worship that, you will end Lord, up in hell fire. That's what the Bible Lord, says. Lord. That's what the third angel's message said. That's the third Lord, angel's Lord. message is not any more popular today than it ever has been. Not even in Adventism. I see. You don't have. You don't have to worship on. We say, oh, don't, don't worship on Sunday. You receive the mark. You don't have to worship on Sunday to, get, to, to, to receive the threatening and the third angel's message. All you have to do is worship the image of the beast. You don't. Need, you don't have to worship the beast. You don't have to become a Roman Catholic. You don't have to worship the Pope. You don't have to. All you have to do is. You don't have to worship on Sunday. Just worship the image. Read Revelation 14, 9 to 11. If you worship the image, you're going to have the same thing happen to you as if you worship the beast or receive the mark. The same thing. You know how bad this is? A few weeks ago, in Loma Linda, California, a man that calls himself a creation seventh day Adventist <clears throat> was arrested and put in jail. He's in jail right now. Yes, Lord. Has he committed a crime? Oh. He's called himself a Seventh-day Adventist. That's, that's uh, the crime he's right. committed. And he's not, he's not a part of their organization. He called himself a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know. And a few days ago, his associate, who had a news conference in Loma Linda and explained their situation, then he was arrested and he's put in jail. Now both of them in jail in I California know. right now. I don't know. I see. We have built an image to the beast. I see you, Lord. I see Study the third angel's message, friend. I love. Read great controversy. I love. What does it mean to build an image to the beast? It means when the church influences the state to do what they want to do. I love. Hmm. Now, before there ever was a third angel's message, before that had ever been written down in the book of Revelation, the Bible is very, very clear about not doing this sort of thing. Yeah. Let's just read it. Look in 1 Corinthians 6. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be defrauded? No, you yourselves do wrong and defraud and you do these things to your brother. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. He said, don't you know? 
The people that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's that plain. That's what the Bible says. Amen. 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 Friends, we're living in dangerous and serious and deceptive times. I know. Help us, precious Lord. We're just like the Jews. We say, we're the people of God. You know, the Jews, Ellen White says, they defied heaven and earth to deprive them of their rights because they knew that they were the people of God. We're the same, we have the same mindset. We're cocky. I know. Friends. You're not the people of God when you're doing this sort of thing. You're not. Amen. Amen. You're the people of the devil. Amen. Jesus told the Jews, He said, you're your father of the devil. He didn't acknowledge that they were the people of God. My love. John 8, 44. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 36, that they were representatives of Satan. When you build an image of the beast, you're not the people of God anymore, friends. Amen. And anybody that goes along with this is not the people of the God either. Yes, Lord. Help us, precious Lord. Help us, Lord. Now, our time is about up. I had some other things I actually was going to talk to you about also. <laughs> Go ahead. The, this lawsuit thing is not the only way that we're building an image to the beast. Yes, brother? If I can mention a couple things that confirm what you're saying. The conference has talked about distributing the great controversy around yes. the United States, and yes. it just came out. They've rewritten the great controversy, the condensed version called yes. the Great Hope. Yes. In that, they took out all references to the papacy being the beast in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is protecting the papacy. Yes. And then also, Vance Farrell, in his December 2011 newsletter, he mentioned how a conference official has told multiple people that the conference signed an agreement in 1999 after five years of meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, that they would no longer promote the Sabbath publicly. Yes. And in 2000, Pope John Paul issued his encyclical, Domini Dies, promoting Sunday worship. They were accommodating the Catholic Church. Yes. Yes. We built an image to the beast. And the dangerous thing about this I have some material prepared to study with you, and I can't study it because we'll run out of time. But in Ellen White's day, she said that what was happening around the turn of the century was the alpha of deadly heresies. Mm -hmm. And she showed how the devil was taking control of the leaders in the Adventist church. Mm -hmm. Now, because we had a living prophet in those days, that crisis was met. And we had a huge loss, but it was met, and we didn't succumb to the alpha of the deadly heresies. But she said the omega is coming after a while. Here's how she described it. She said, already there are coming in among our people, this is during the time of the alpha, spiritualistic teachings that will undermine the faith of those who give heed to them. Those who continue to hold these spiritualistic theories will surely spoil their Christian experience sever their connection with God, and lose eternal life. Hmm. This is all in volume 8, pages 292-293. The experience of the past will be repeated. In the future, Satan's superstitions will assume new forms. Minds will be hypnotized. The most sorrowful thought of all is that under his deceptive influence, men will have a form of godliness without a real connection with God. That's the most awful part of it. People will be hypnotized. They'll be controlled by the devil, but they'll think they're following the Lord. That, my friend, is what happened to the Jews. Wow. We've always assumed that what happened to the Jews wouldn't happen to us. How do you know? And why says in the book Desire of Ages that the leaders of the Jews in Christ was here, that they were just as much under the control of Satan as were the demoniacs. They were devil-possessed. But nobody knew it because it looked like they were holy people. Do you realize, friends, that if the devil got control of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I'm not saying he has or hasn't, that's up to the Lord to decide who controls what. But if the devil got control of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it would look like we were having the greatest of thrust in evangelism, and we were ha having the most, most godliness and the greatest spiritual experience that we've ever had. That's what would happen, because that would be the most deceptive people with great, great controversy. She talks about that very thing. At the end of the world, the whole world will think that they're having the greatest revival of all time. But it's under the control of a different spirit. Uh, Amen. Mercy. 
My dear friends, it's time for Adventists to wake up. Amen. My heart is burdened. I don't enjoy having to tell you these things, but let me tell you why I'm telling you. We are facing the prospect, if what's happening right now keeps going on, we're facing the prospect of seeing the whole Seventh-day Adventist Church destroyed at some point. And I don't want you to get destroyed with it. My Lord. That's what happened to the Jews. My Lord. She says here, the hypnotic influence of Satan will rest upon those who turn from the plain word of God to pleasing fables. <laughs> Is the hypnotic influence of Satan in Adventism today? Many years ago already now. We just found this out recently. We didn't know what was going on. We're not going around trying to figure out what's going on. But many years ago already, over ten. We know this from things that have recently come to light. By people that were in it at Oakwood College, among other places. For over twenty years over ten years. I don't know how much over 10 years, but over t for over 10 years. The spiritualistic exercises that are practiced by the Jesuits have been introduced into the Adventist educational system. And we're using these things to train all of our ministers. Mercy, Lord. Mercy. If you get all the ministers trained with these things, what do you think is going to happen in the church? church? Mercy, Lord. Help us, precious. Now, if you want to get some documentation on this, you can look at this book right here. The Truth About Spiritual Formation is compiled by Vance Farrell. It's an amazing book. If you don't have it, you ought to get it and read it. I'm not here to sell books. I don't make any money if he sells these. That's, that's not it. But you need the information. What's going on? Let me put it to you as simple as I know how to put it. The devil is trying to get control of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and he's having amazing success. Amen. And my dear friend, Ellen White wrote about this, warned us over and over and over again. You read Early Rise, page seventy-one. She talks about Seventh Day Adventists. She says some of them will not wake up until the plagues begin to fall. And I used to wonder, how could that happen? How could you have all these things happen? And the probation closes and the place begin to fall and people not even be awake till then. It'll be too late to be saved then, let me tell you. Yes. The path of apostasy, I've said this many times, it's not like falling off a cliff. It's like going down a stair, 12,000 stairs. Each step is just a little step down. Now we're at the place where we found out just recently that there are crediting associations by the way, are these accrediting associations, are they controlled by people that are going to be in the 144,000? There are accrediting associations that tell universities and colleges, especially those that are training ministers, that if you're going to be accredited, you have to teach spiritual formation to your ministers. The trap is set. We've already put a foot in it. Now, I have people say to me, well, God is going to turn things around. Let me, in closing, let me just address that question. I've been told that for over 50 years. I, I received information on that, that God was going to turn, around, turn things around from the head of the theology department at Southern Missionary College in College Hill, Tennessee, over 50 years ago. I've been watching to see God things turn around since that time. Because I was asking questions then, how come this and this and this and this? And people said, well, we know it's wrong, but God's going to turn everything around. God hasn't turned it around yet. So let me ask you a question. If God is going to turn something around for us or for anybody, study religious history, how does God turn things around? Do you understand how God turns things around? Let's look at a few examples quickly in closing. The children of Israel got so bad in such an apostate condition that they were worshiping Baal and all these idols. And what did God do to turn them around? He sent them Elijah the prophet. And if you listen to the prophet, you got turned around. Let me tell you. Amen. 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 What about the people that didn't listen? 
<laughs> Never got turned around. The Jews. God is such a God finally He sent his, all the prophets and then He sent His Son to the Jews. And the people that listened, they got turned around. But the Jews that didn't listen to what Jesus had to say, what happened to them? Did they get turned around? No. The Roman Catholic Church got into such a condition of apostasy that in the 16th century, God sent them a means to get them turned around. He sent some reformers. And the people that listened to those reformers, did they get turned around? Yes. They did. What happened to the people who wouldn't listen? They never got turned around. The same thing happened in the Second Advent Movement. God sent the first and the second angel's message. We just studied that this morning. And the people that listened to that, did they get turned around? Amen. Yes, they did. What happened to the people that didn't listen? They never got turned around. Do you know, friends, that God has sent to the Seventh day Adventist Church revival and Reformation preachers in every generation now for several generations? My love. My love. Several generations. We could go clear back. I could go back and tell you back to the 1930s every decade. And if people listen, they get turned around. But the people that don't listen, they're never going to get turned around. Amen. And I want to tell you, friends, we are very close to the end of the world. Amen. 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 And the work is going to be finished. But it's not going to be finished the way people have imagined that it's going to be finished. Just the way the work got finished when Jesus came to, but it didn't get finished the way they, the Jews thought it would. It's going to be the same thing again. Ellen White says that over and over. Be the same, it's going to be the same just before the second coming as it was just before the first coming. Friend, we have not only formed an image of the beast by going to the courts to enforce our will, we formed an image of the beast by training our ministers with the spiritualistic exercises of Ignatius Loyola that they used to train the Jesuits. We're, we're doing the same thing. We're in danger of having our whole clergy taken over by evil spirits. Mercy, Lord. And friend, you better stay out of it. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. You, if you mingle with it, you'll get taken over and you, you'll get hypnotized and won't even know it. Yes? Oh, example of what? Okay. This book, he documents it. One of the things that is done in the spiritualistic exercises of the Jesuits is people are taught, taught what is called contemplative prayer. And so you get a mantra, and that is a word or a phrase or a sentence. And when you pray, you just say that over and over and over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. Now, after you've said something several hundred times, let me ask you this: What happens to your brain? You said just that. So suppose that your mantra was "God is love," and so you just say that for 45 minutes or an hour or two hours. You just say "God is love" over and over and over and over. Does, did Jesus have anything to say about that? See, this comes from ancient Buddhism. Jesus said when you pray, do not use vain repetitions like the heathen do. For your Father in heaven knows what things you have needed before you ask Him. Amen. Don't do that. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly what's being done. Amen. Now, after you, after you say something over and over again, Mercy. for an hour or two, because you're trying to get really spiritual. Mercy. Trying to improve your prayer life. Spend a lot of time in prayer. Mercy. You know what happens in the brain? Well, you're just saying it without even thinking. My love. So what's your brain doing? Love. It's just in neutral. You're not really concentrating on anything. You're just over and over. That sets up a mental condition where you can be taken over by an evil spirit. Amen. Amen. So an evil spirit can control your brain. Your mind. I see. If, I don't know if we have any videos yet, but before, before Pope Paul John II visited, I think it was uh, in St. Louis, about 1999 we had a video and it showed it showed the young people there and what they were singing they sang that a song with you know give me a p give me an o give me a p give me an e and they just they said that over and over, they sang it over and over again for six or eight hours mm. well by the time that's over your mind is in such a state that you can your mind can be taken over so what happens is 
you get taken over by an evil spirit, but you don't know it because you're still being real religious. You're being Christian. Remember what Ellen White says in the book Great Controversy? The devil himself is converted after the modern order of things. So the, the spirits will profess, and in in, she says in the Great Controversy, they will profess faith in the Christian religion. The evil spirits will all be Christians. And uh, they will lead the Christians. And uh, they will know that they're being led. They will think that they're having the most marvelous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the thing that's going to, the overwhelming thing that's going to happen is there's going to be miracles. Miracles of healing. And that's what the book of Revelation says. That the world's going to be deceived by miracles. It says in Revelation 13, Revelation 16, Revelation 18, Revelation 19. It says it over and over again. The world's going to be deceived by miracles. And that's what we're getting set up for right now. And we're getting set up where our ministers, their minds are being taken over by evil spirits, the people that are engaged in this kind of business. This is directly contrary to the words of Jesus and what the New Testament and the spirit of prophecy teach. Directly contrary, but we're in it. Well, I didn't come here to, to bring you bad news because Jesus is coming soon, but you know, you're going to have to learn, listen to the three English messages if you're going to be ready. Amen. And listening Amen. to the three English messages involves that you're not going to have anything to do Amen. with the beast or the image of the beast. Amen. It's not enough to just say, well, I go to a Sabbath keeping church, so I won't receive the mark of the beast. I'm okay. That's not enough. Amen. You can go to a Sabbath keeping church and worship the image of the beast. Amen. And that's being done. Amen. That's being done right now because we've built an image of the beast. Amen. And if you're controlled by that, well then. Read the three angels' message for yourself. Amen. Well, let's have a word of prayer for you. Amen. Father in heaven, I pray for each person here, for each family represented here. And Lord, we are living in the most deceptive time of our yes, history. Lord, thank you. And we are the weakest of any generation that's ever lived. And so we look to you because we know that unless you intervene, you have told us that unless you intervene, that not one man or woman, boy or girl, would escape the devil's net. We know that he has a trap set for every one of us. And Lord, we pray that in mercy upon us, that you will deliver us, that we may escape his snares. We pray for all who bear your name, all that bear the name Christians, all that bear the name Seventh-day Adventists. We pray for them all, that they may be listening for that still, small voice. And Lord, you delivered people who were under the control of Satan when you were here. But unfortunately, you could not deliver the leaders of your church. And oh Lord, we pray that you'll help us to be listening for that still small voice. We pray that you'll stay, save us from the trap that the devil has set to ensnare us all. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake.